Thanks so much for coming. Welcome to UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Um, I'm Jeff Lewis. I'm the horticulturist here. So I'll be talking about birds. <laughs> but thanks for coming. Um, the way we usually do this is we'll save the questions for last. And then um, somebody will come around with a microphone to really put you on the spot. So with, without further ado, we'll get started. Um, the program tonight, this evening, is um, coastal habitats of the Outer Banks and the birds that they support. There are lots of nice habitats out here. In fact, I didn't even get them all squeezed in. But this is a, if you haven't figured it out yet, this is a view from the Body Island Lighthouse. You now that you can climb the lighthouse, nice views, several types of habitat there. And this, these are the types, these are the habitat types we're going to cover. The surf zone and beach, inlets, spoil islands, which are dredged spoil islands, dune and scrub habitat, salt marsh and mud flats, or you may call them tidal flats, um, man-made impoundments, freshwater marsh, and maritime forest. So we don't have things like golf courses and airports and <laughs> residential sessions, and, although they're good habitats for stuff. Okay, we'll start at the beach which is where everybody's mind is these days. Um, what I'm calling the surf zone and beach is from the ocean to the first primary dunes, the primary dunes, and then from the, from the beach out, you know, as far as you can see, several hundred yards. And um, the beaches are, are great habitat for birds. Um, gulls particularly like to, like to rest on the beaches, and you see terns on the beaches, lots of um, shorebirds, and lots of birds feed over the water, dive into the water. This is probably the bird you're most familiar with at the beach as far as shorebirds. Those little sanderlings that, that follow the waves back when they withdraw and then turn around and race away from the water when it breaks. And they get a few little pecks in the sand in the meantime. Um, other, birds, other birds you may see on the beach include the black-bellied plover and, and the ruddy turnstone, and especially the willet. You see these big gray and white willets, and they also feed right in the wash, and you see them a lot of times They'll catch these mole crabs. <clears throat> uh, ruddy turnstones usually walk along higher up on the beach wherever the debris, debris is and they'll flip things over. That's where they get their name. They'll flip over little shells and stones and they search for food that way. And then black bellied plovers usually are higher up on the beach as well. <clears throat> and this is just a nice shot of a flock of mostly sanderlings. Um, also on the beaches, you'll see these um, fish crows, which is the large photo. Fish crows and grackles, they kind of clean up everything. They'll eat, you know, invertebrates, th dead things in the sand, um, human debris, eat your french fries if you leave them. Um, grackles, I know, eat a lot of seeds. They're kind of the cleanup crew here. If you spend any time on the beach at all, you'll certainly see brown pelicans flying by. Um, <clears throat> which the brown pelicans themselves are quite a story. They were, they were really decimated for a long time and they've made quite a comeback. So we're lucky to have the numbers of brown pelicans that we have now. Um, here are a few of the birds you may see feeding over the ocean. The terns are the ones that sort of tuck their wings and dive in, bill first, and they'll come up with a little fish a lot of the times. Um, gulls more or less just sit in the water and try to pluck things out of the water. And then in the summer, we have the ospreys that are here nesting. And of course, they, they make the spectacular talon first leaps into the water and come up with fish sometimes, larger fish. So the one, well, this, this is the um, Forster's turn and a sandwich turn and a royal turn and a lease turn. And they all have, they're all different sizes or have different bills or something about them that's different. The lease turn is our smallest turn. If you look out over the ocean, um, especially in the fall and winter, you'll see strings of birds going by. They just look like black dots from a, from a distance. Um, a, lot of times, a lot of time they're scoters, which are a sea duck. This is a flock of mixed scoters here, black scoters and surf scoters. Um, we, we also have a lot of loons that migrate up and down the beach and grebes and mergansers, <clears throat> brant, and gannets. And they don't all migrate. I mean, they don't all, they don't all migrate past. So a lot of them stay and spend the winter. So you can also see them 
you know, in the water feeding. So here are a few shots of <clears throat> what they look like in the water. I mean, there, and there are some days in the fall you can, you can count thousands of red-throated loons, for instance. So there really are a lot of birds out there. There's a lot of fish and other food items in our ocean. There's a red-throated loon, a common loon, red-breasted merganser down here, um, horned grebe. Sometimes there's lots of horned grebe, sometimes there are not. And here are some surf scoters. <clears throat> Um, the northern gannets, I'm sure you've watched them if you spend any time here in the winter. They really put on a show at times, especially if there's like a big school of menhaden or something. You can see sometimes there are just hundreds and hundreds of these gannets, and they dive in from way up high, like 50 feet high. They'll dive into the water like arrows, and they actually, you know, they actually dive under and then chase the fish underwater. They don't just, they're not just impaling a fish instantly as they dive. They actually can chase the fish underwater. That's a pretty amazing creature here. And they're large birds, almost the size of a pelican. As you get, as you get closer to the inlets and get to places like Pea Island and Hatteras Island where the beaches are wider, you have even more birds than, than up here on the northern beaches. You know, wider beaches, less traffic, less people, more birds. So this, was a, this is not unusual, actually, but this is the big flock of cormorants that was on the beach there at the north end of... Island. Okay. Um, as the beaches start getting wider and people become more scarce, uh, birds start nesting on our beaches. And probably the most common nesting bird around here are these little small um, leased terns. They have just about, they probably just arrived about now and they're, they're starting to nest. All they, all they do is build a little scrape in the sand. It's just a little depression in the sand. They don't build a nest that you can really see. And then as you can see in these photographs, the eggs are very camouflaged. And then the eggs, this is a photograph here of eggs and a chick. See how, how camouflaged the chick is? So, so what fish and wildlife do is they rope off these areas and put signs up to keep you out because otherwise you literally could just walk right through and walk on a nest and not even know it. They're very camouflaged. And the, the left-hand picture is, is the, male, the male turn presenting the female with a fish. It's a courtship ritual. And the middle photograph at the bottom was actually taken in Man's Harbor in the parking lot at the marina. Sometimes they'll nest in parking lots and places like that. Sometimes they'll nest on the roofs of buildings. Um, Belk used to have a lot of them that, roosted, that nested up there. Um, black skimmers, that's another, it's, they're actually related to terns. It's another common nesting bird around here. They nest um, places like Oregon Inlet and Hatteras. They're interesting birds because of their bill. Um, they, have the, they have the lower mandibles a lot larger than the upper mandible. And it's like a blade that runs this way. And they feed by... They feed by flying just above the surface of the water with their lower mandible skimming the water. And then when, when their mandible makes contact with a prey item, they snap it up. If it makes contact with seaweed or something, then they'll just tilt their head back and it washes right off and they never even stop flying. <clears throat> but they're very interesting birds. They're actually related to the terns. And um, if, if you look at the bottom right photograph here, you see the adult skimmer, do you see anything else? You probably can't see it from where you are. Anyway, there are some babies right here laying flat in the sand. And once again, they're very camouflaged. They're very susceptible to, to people and dogs and things that don't even know they're there and just walk over them. <clears throat> um, everybody's favorite on the Outer Banks, piping plovers. Um, they're actually an adorable little shorebird, little, little plover. They, they like to nest on the wide beaches up in the high, dry sand, although they, they feed down in the wet areas. <clears throat> this is a big, chunky shorebird, probably our biggest, heaviest shorebird of all American oyster catchers. Very noisy, too. They nest on the wide beaches. 
Um, they like to nest where there's rocks or some other debris they can kind of hide behind. And, and the left hand, the little round photo on the left is a picture of the eggs, camouflage as always. And um, top right, this is one actually catching oysters. <laughs> They're able, to, they're, they're able to cut the muscle and open the oysters and eat oysters. And then bottom right, once again, here are some chicks. Easily identified by that, just by the bright orangey red bill. Okay, so we've been on the beach. We've, we've approached the inlets. We're going to go ahead into the inlets here. The, the oyster catchers are wel welcoming us into the inlet. And you, you see where this is. This is um, Oregon Inlet. Um, the inlets are good foraging places for shorebirds, good feeding grounds for terns and gulls and ducks and all kinds of things. It's, you know, it's very dynamic with the, with the tidal flows, wind tides and lunar tides. Um, this is the right turnstone that's just called a little crab mixed in with the seaweed. This is the spot of sandpiper wishing he could find a little crab. And shorebird, shorebird plumage has really changed. This spot of sandpipers in breeding plumage, all these nice spots. In a couple of months, it's just going to be plain white underneath. So they really are amazing. And um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, attraction for birds at, at Oregon Inlet is man-made. This groin or jetty that they put in many years ago is just a fabulous place to attract. You know, it's covered in, in different kind of shells and just all kinds of stuff, you know, algaes and seaweeds and all kinds of animals, invertebrates. It sort of attracts a lot of birds and fish. Um, here are some uh, ruddy turnstones and those are actually sanderlings just, just resting on one, on one of the rocks. You can see the kind of stuff that lives on the rocks. And here, this is a um, a Dunlin in the back middle and a purple sandpiper in the front with two sandaling bookends. But see all the barnacles and all the stuff, all the, all the goo on the rocks. Here's a purple sandpiper feeding. And you want to stay off of these rocks too, they're very slippery. Um, but Oregon Inlet, I mentioned how good it was for feeding. I mean, look at this. There must be one heck of a school of fish in there. And the day I took this, the morning I took these photographs, or this photograph, there were also dolphins working in there too. So must have been a, must have been a um, this was, um, I think this was last December, unless it was December a year ago, but it was December. But sometimes it's like this first thing in the morning and then it all clears out. So we have a lot of gulls here and pelicans and cormorants. A pretty amazing sight. Fish doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> Here's another shot of some pelicans feeding. Pelicans are a lot of fun to watch feeding. Here's some close-ups. You can readily tell the immature pelicans from the adults. The adults have all the colors, all the patterns, the yellows and the browns. And the, 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 the young birds are just brown. But it's interesting, if you see the, bot the bottom left image, see how the See how the, um, the pouch is all swollen out and how filled, filled with water. So they, you know, they'll, they have to squeeze that water out. I won't make you do this. I just came up with this slide yesterday. I thought it might be something cute for the future, but um, I, I just transferred some, some birds th to this picture. But, the, the bridge itself, the point is, the bridge itself is really good habitat for different birds. There are shorebirds that feed on the barnacles and, and other critters, just like um, they do on the rocks. And um, the bridge attracts lots of um, diving ducks and, and loons and grebes. But I won't make you name this stuff. I'll do it for you. Um, the little ones here are purple sandpipers. I know it's hard to tell from your seats. And these are ruddy turnstones. This is your American, um, I mean, your black, black, your American oyster catcher. Just came back from California. There were black oyster catchers over there. Um, Long-tailed duck, real pretty, used to be called old squalls. And then the bottom two are your, are your male and female, male and female black scoter. This is a surf scoter, and this is a common eider. The common eider is pretty unusual around here. We, 
We almost get them every winter, but it's a big old sea duck with a big long bill, and he's, he's got a crab actually holding on. <clears throat> um, every now and then we'll get harlequin ducks, which are really cool. They're such beautiful and such, they're such northern and rare ducks for our area. In 2014, we actually had five of them, five if not six. Start out one, it was two, then it was three. They just kind of built their numbers. And the adult male was just absolutely stunning. They, they hung around the bridge. After a while, I got them trained where they would swim in the patterns I wanted them to swim. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, that was a real treat. I hope, hope it um, plays out again sometime soon. These are actually ducks that nest along streams, freshwater streams, like in the rocks and things. Okay, um, we've made it through the inlet. We're behind the inlet. We're in Pamlico Sound. And there are a lot of these dredge spoil islands, which are another man-made habitat, which is working out real well for the wildlife. Um, it's, you know, it's where they pump the sand when they're dredging. They pump it in one spot, and it builds up and forms an island. When the, islands are, um, when the islands are bare, like the top photo here, they're very attractive to terns and skimmers and maybe, maybe smart piping plovers. And then when they, as, they, as they become vegetated, when they first become vegetated, the gulls really seem to like them. And then, oh, and they're also, they're also good resting areas other than nesting. You know, I mean, they're used year-round by the birds. In the winter, you'll see, you'll see this kind of thing going on. And actually, I've seen harbor seals hauled up on the islands, too. Um, this is, um, I think this is Parnell Island out there. This is, just, this is a really good island for terns, and there's some skimmers over here nesting. This is just what it looks like when you come off the boat. They do put signs up during the nesting seasons to keep you off the islands. So here's some more scenes. There's some black skimmers nesting. And then bottom left to right is a piping plover and some leash terns and an American oyster catcher. Now, the, the, the main advantage that the islands have over the beach is obvious, the, the, the lack or the reduction of predators. I mean, there are still aerial predators like gulls and hawks that can terrorize these, these birds. But there are, you know, there are no raccoons, no foxes, unless they're really good swimmers. Um, I was told there are no ghost crabs on these islands. Um, you see in the middle, the, there's a least turn trying to shoo off a, a ghost crab. That was at Oregon Inlet. That wasn't on a, an island. And then no cats and dogs or humans also, which caused a lot of damage. So the, um, <clears throat> the islands are a good thing. When they, started, when they start becoming even more vegetated and they start growing woodies like shrubs and small trees, the pelicans really take over. And actually, I think, this, I think this is Pelican Island. There's one out there they call Pelican Island. And see, here's a nest in a, in a cedar tree, a juniper. <clears throat> so anyway, a few years ago, I went out there with them for one of their um, pelican banding days, and it was quite an adventure. Um, it was really smelly, but it was a lot of fun. There were pelicans everywhere. <clears throat> and it was the second... The second trip of the year banding. So there were a lot of them that had already been banded. So our jobs were to, were to pick them up one at a time by the bill without getting struck in the face, pick them up by the bill and check for bands. And if they had a band, we could put them back down and go to the next one. And then if they had not been banded, we had to find a bander and, and get them banded. But the most amazing thing to me, <clears throat> the most amazing thing to me was that this one day out there on this island, there was practically the whole life cycle of the pelican. You would think they'd all be on the same, uh, same uh, schedule, but we saw eggs that were not hatched. We actually watched this one hatch and slightly older ones and slightly older ones and a little bit older ones and a little bit older ones all the way to the adults. So that was really amazing. And it was really great for me as a photographer to be able to get them all on one trip. So <clears throat> it's a lot of fun. I, I recommend it. But it is work. It is definitely work. I couldn't take pictures the whole time. I had to actually work, and every now and then I'd get the camera out and take a picture. <clears throat> and there were a few people with bloody faces, but nobody lost an eye, so it was good. Okay, so we're, we're, we've come back around to the, to the beach again. This time we're going to walk. 
So we're going to, we cross the dunes, and this is what you typically see. Um, a lot of scrub habitat, um, sea oats and beach grass, um, goldenrod and, and just all kinds of scrubby, real you know, salt tolerant grasses like, like broom straw and all that. Um, salt tolerant shrubs like wax myrtles. And um, it's still a fairly inhospitable place, but there, but there are birds that like this habitat. Uh, you can find eastern meadowlarks out there. They nest out there in that scrubby stuff. Um, Towhees and field sparrows are two of the two of the sparrow family birds that, that may nest there, depending on where you are. Um, there's certainly a lot of mockingbirds out there in that habitat, as well as catbirds, especially when it starts becoming a little lusher. When it becomes a little more lush, the catbirds like it better. Um, in the fall, we have fall migrants, and some of the a lot of the fall migrants use that habitat for, for feeding. <clears throat> and then a few of them um, stay for the winter, including these birds. On the, the left, the large, the large picture is a, is a photograph of yellow rumped warbler. We have tons of those in the winter. And it takes a lot of birds that are that big to make tons, because <laughs> they don't weigh much. We have tons of those in the winter. And um, also, top right, we have palm warblers, which kind of act like sparrows because they like to feed on the ground mostly, but they're not sparrows, they're warblers. And some of them are really yellow and some are really drab. That one's called a bee or something like that. And then um, bottom right is a savanna sparrow. There are several sparrows that spend the winter out there. Savanna is probably the most common one in the open habitats. <clears throat> and, you know, whenever you have a lot of birds, you'll have raptors. So um, this is one of our smallest ones. This is an American kestrel. This is the, the smallest falcon that we have. They feed, on, they feed on insects and mice and small birds. We grew up calling them sparrow hawks. You probably did too. You see them a lot on power lines. Okay, so we've run into the salt marsh here. There's a lot of salt marsh around here, thank goodness. Um, you just came by. Well, actually, there's a lot out right out the window here. Um, Mostly the salt marsh is on the sound side of the Outer Banks, or it's places like along the causeway over here where there used to be an inlet. So, you know, the low spots, it's in the low spots. And um, of course it varies, the salinity varies. Some of it is very salty, some is brackish, kind of like out here. We even have some freshwater birds nesting out here. So I'm wondering if, if ours is even freshwater marsh. But anyway, we're gonna go with salt right now. And there are lots of animals, lots of birds that, that use and feed in or live in this, this salt marsh. You see in this little tidal, this little, uh, tidal pool here, there are several shorebirds and wading birds that are feeding in here. But when I think of, when I think of salt marsh, I think of rails. Rails live, live in the marsh. You can hear them pretty often. You, you rarely see them. They're, they're thin as a rail. You've heard the expression, they're, they're laterally, laterally compressed. They're fairly thin. They can just run through this thick marsh like you could see out here. And, um, you know, occasionally they'll come out in the mornings or when the water's real high or, the, or when the water's real low and you can actually see them. This is the clapper rail. This is, the, this is the, the common large rail that we have in the salt marshes. And then we have a smaller one that's called a Virginia rail. It's a little more colorful. A good place to see these, if you want to actually see them, if you want to hang around a while, um, probably one of the best places to see them is the, the body pond little boardwalk because they'll come out there sometimes into the open for a few seconds. Um, we, have, we have a sparrow that nests out in the, out in the juncus, out in the Spartina. These um, seaside sparrows are not the prettiest birds in the world, but um, hey, they get the job done. They fill a niche. But um, there's, there's an adult, oops, adult on the right there, and this is a juvenile bird. They're, they're, out, they're, they're out there singing all summer and nesting. Then in the fall, we have a couple of um, migrants that come down that join them. 
The one on the left is a Nelson sparrow. We have, we have pretty good numbers of those. The, the salt marsh sparrow, we don't have as many of. That's why I don't have as good a photograph of it. They're pretty hard to, they're pretty hard to see, though. You, you, you sort of have to walk out in the marsh and just walk through it, and eventually you'll find them, usually on the backside near the sound. <clears throat> Um, another bird that likes to nest, nest in or around the salt marshes are, are willets. Although it's only one species, we actually have two willets. We have an eastern willet, which nests here, and then we have a western willet, which comes down in the fall and spends the winter. And they're probably going to split them into two species soon. But um, the eastern willet is this one. And look at the difference between breeding plumage and, and winter plumage. So they, they really change during the breeding season. But they like to nest back kind of on high, high ground in some matted down grass. And they're really pretty when their wings are open. <clears throat> um, boat tail grackles are common back in the salt marshes and they nest, they nest kind of in the edges, edges of the marsh where it starts getting woody, where there's shrubs and small stunted trees that build their, build their nest out there. And they make a terrible racket. Um, here's another shot of a, of a tidal pool, tidal creek, whatever you want to call it, back in a salt marsh. The pelicans are having a field day. Pelicans and terns and gulls. Lots of fish go up in these salt marshes. You know, the salt marshes are really good nurseries for our fish, too. Very important to protect them. Here's a white ibis. You all been seeing them migrating in the last few weeks? Every day here at work, I've been seeing them flying up from the, from the south. Here's, kind of, here's a mixed flock, uh, mostly snowy egrets with the, with the yellow lures here. And then most of the, um, I guess all the ibis have got their backs turned on me. And then there's, an unusual, then there's a cattle egret back here on the shore just looking, trying, trying to figure things out. This is not cattle egret habitat. Cattle egrets like <clears throat> cattle. They like um, to be in like farm situations, they'll hang around cows and horses and things. <clears throat> um, okay, in, in and around the salt marshes are these tidal flats. I almost could have lumped them into one category, but at least I'm going to have them consecutively. But these, these mud flats are just super great habitat for shorebirds and lots of other things. Birds can rest in these areas, you know, without feeling threatened, they can, you know, versus a beach. Like this, um, this flock of terns, this is a flock of mostly royal terns and probably some other stuff in there. I think I see a skimmer, but mostly royal terns. But they love to, to roost in these areas or just loaf, just rest in these areas where they're safe. <clears throat> the shorebirds do most of the actual feeding back here, and we have a lot of shorebirds in this area. That's a beautiful marble goblet on top, top left. Nice cinnamon colors. And look at the bills on these birds. Look how the marble goblet's got kind of an upturned bill. On the right here, top right, a semi-palmated plover. A little short bill. They just kind of walk and peck. But the bottom left is a semi-palmated plover. And the semi-palmated the semi word that they share in common, that's referring to their feet. I won't go into any details. They're just like a palm. So um, in the bottom right is a, a twofer. It's a Hudsonian goblet, which is kind of rare around here, and a black belly plover, which is kind of common. Some more, some uh, short billed dowagers on the top left, and a beautiful black neck stilt on the right, lesser yellow legs, and a dunlin. But um, these birds all feed in mud flats. They have different techniques, like the black neck stilt can feed in deeper water. That's only half of its legs. Actually, the reflection, if you just imagine the reflection of his leg, that's about how long they are. They have really long legs, so they can walk around in deeper water. And um, whereas this little fellow, the dunlin, has got short legs and just kind of feeds up in the mud. So they all feed together, but separately. Um, Here's a little small group of American avocets. They're, they're beautiful birds. Um, look at their bills. See the, the one that's got the bill out of the water? It just goes down and curves up. 
So they, they can hold their head down until that, the curved up part is level, horizontal, and they walk, they, they feed by walking back and forth and swishing their bill back and forth. And then when they contact prey, they can snap it up. And this was just kind of a nice behavior shot. This is a photograph of a water snake that was crossing the mud flats, and, and it's a predator to birds, and you'd think the birds would just scatter, but what the birds were doing was following it, staying with the snake. So I just, I just titled it, Keep Your Friends Close, Your Enemies Closer. You know, as long as they know where it is, they're not in any danger, but if they turn their back on it, then who knows? So I just thought that was kind of neat. And these are dowagers and some, looks like western sandpipers. And this, was in, this was actually in Body Pond, you know, mud flats vary a lot as to whether they're mud flats or whether they're just water. You know, um, tides or wind tides or rain can make the water levels rise and drop. <clears throat> this, um, these are mud flats where the tide has, um, the tide was in and now it's gone out and it's left this little um, pool of water and that's concentrated the fish. And these, these wading birds, you know, have discovered that. And so they're really cashing in on this buffet here. So you've got, you've got, um, you've got a big, you've got a great egret and some, some tricolored herons and lots of snowy egrets and some, some white ibis. The young white ibis are brown and there's one laughing gull there. So if you can, never, if you can find this situation, it's great as a birder or a photographer, but it happens a lot. <clears throat> and the birds actually get used to this happening and they'll just hang around like hours before it happens and wait for it to happen. <clears throat> okay. Shifting gears again. Another type of habitat which is man-made and, and just one of the best ones around. Impoundments. Impoundments kind of include all the habitats, not all the habitats, but many of the ones we've just talked about. And this is at Pea Island. All of our national wildlife refuges in this area have impoundments. Um, impoundments are, you know, like I said, man-created. They're built. They're primarily fresh water. Um, usually they can control the water levels. And they probably were mostly built thinking about waterfowl because, you know, fish and wildlife used to be fish and game and it was all about waterfowl and the money came from ducks and things. So. They're mostly about waterfowl, but they, they serve a, a, good, a good purpose for, they're a good source of food for a lot of birds. So this is at North Pond. This is actually New Field, which is the middle impoundment. And I could not get them to take that pole down. <laughs> but this is what it may look like on a given day in the winter, or it may not, but I mean, it just varies from week to week, especially month to month. But, you know, you've got waterfowl out there in the, in the impoundments, and then you've got all the wading birds along the edge here. And here's another shot. This is the north end of North Pond. And they do have, a, they do have some observation platforms you can look from. And, you know, as well as a trail that goes all the way around some of the impoundments, one of the impoundments. <clears throat> so it's a great place to check out in the in the fall and winter for birds. You want to go in the morning though because in the afternoon you're looking into the sun. <clears throat> um, and they, you know, they do, they try to manage the water level so that the SAV, the submerged aquatic vegetation, thrives so that the waterfowl have something to eat. <clears throat> so here's some black ducks and a northern shoveler hiding in the back. Um, some gadwall, and actually these are two species that nest here. A um, couple of black neck stilts. You see anything different about these two stilts? Different color legs, right? Yeah. What, what the leg color tells you is that the bird on the left is an immature bird. The one on the right is an adult. A lot of birds have different plumages and different bear part colors when they're young. <clears throat> um, here's another shot of avocets. We saw some earlier. These are going into breeding plumage. They're getting that nice orange color on their heads and necks. 
and they're doing their little swishy feeding thing. These have nested at Pea Island historically, but they don't usually. And they're really beautiful when you get a big flock of them in flight. Um, here's some more shorebirds that hang out at the impoundments. <clears throat> Greater yellow legs, semi palmated sandpiper, a dunlin, short billed doucher. And this little fella, this is a strange little shorebird. This is a Wilson's phalarope. We have three species of phalaropes. And this one obviously is just walking along in the mud flat looking for prey and kind of picking and plucking. But what phalaropes do a lot and what they're known for is feeding in the water. And what they'll do is spin round and round in the water. And they'll create this vortex that sucks up prey from the bottom. And that's what they're known for. So if you ever, if you ever see a bird, a shorebird, a little gray, white and gray shorebird doing spinning around the water, then you know it's one of our phalaropes. So, Interesting little tidbit. And notice they have a really long needle point bill, just a really sharp bill. <clears throat> um, waders, waders like the um, wading birds, like the impoundments. There's a lot of fish and different things in there. Here's some waders, a great blue heron, little blue heron, white ibis in the middle, um, snowy egret, black crowned night heron, great egret and a tricolored heron. If you, if you have an old field guide, they, they may call tricolored heron Louisiana heron. It's time to update. Um, the black crowned night heron is nocturnal. Usually you don't see them during the day unless you see them. They'll be roosting in dense shrubs. This was just a... <laughs> um, that, these great egrets were, I don't, know, I don't know what they were doing. It just reminded me of the Hatfields and McCoys. They, were, they, they split into two groups, and they were just fussing at each other. It's like, whatever. <laughs> um, this, is, this bird is related to the herons and egrets. This is a bittern, an American bittern. And we have pretty good numbers of them in the winter, but you hardly ever see them because they're very secretive, and they stay back in the salt marsh. Every now and then, if you keep your eyes peeled, you can see them along Highway 12, feeding along the edge of the ditch. But this one was, um, was just perfect. It was out in the open, nice, calm water. I was able to get lots of pictures, including this one, where he was just, he was, he was meeting his reflection. And they're, they're, um, they're sort of short, chunky herons. Like I said, the impoundments were mainly put here for the waterfowl, and there are lots of waterfowl here in the winter. Um, this is mostly a flock of redheads just getting ready to settle down. There have been the last several years on the Christmas bird counts, we counted, um, I don't remember, like I think last year we had 20,000 redheads on, on, on Newfield and South Pond You know, that, at one time. It's a lot of ducks. It was like... I should have put a picture in here of it. It was like, it looked like an island. If you just drove by casually, you would just think that was land out there and it was just the ducks. <clears throat> so this is them, this is some of them um, landing. Um, here are some more ducks you may see out there. Top left is, is um, Gadwall. The middle one, oh, you know what that is, it's a mallard. Um, hooded merganser, lesser scalp. There's a lesser and a greater scalp. Um, green wing teal, and a northern shoveler. And then the background shot are redheads and canvas backs and scalp. Well, yeah, it's, a pretty, it's a really a pretty sight when they're present in such large, no, large numbers. <clears throat> um, a, few more, a few more ducks, blue wing teal, top left. Um, there's a northern shoveler in flight showing the nice blue and white on the wings that they have. Um, northern pintail down here. This is one of our most one of our most common ducks when the redheads aren't around. <clears throat> Traditionally, year after year, we have more pintails than anything. <clears throat> and then American widgeon on the bottom left. <clears throat> um, geese geese are real popular with with bird watchers and, and 
and even people that aren't bird watchers, just, you know, everybody likes to see the snow geese. Um, unfortunately, we don't have as many on the Outer Banks as we used to. I can remember 30 years ago, if you drove from here to Hatteras, they were everywhere on the side of roads, up in the dunes. I guess most, I don't know that they're declining. I guess most of them now are just in some of the more inland areas like um, Mad Mesquite Refuge. They have a lot. And the Precocian Lakes Refuge has a lot. We still get good flocks of them, though, at Pea Island. Um, that's where this was taken. They tend to be at South Pond, which is the southernmost impoundment. But they'll, they'll be next to the road most of the time, so you can see them. And they get all muddy. Um, bird watchers typically look through these flocks and look for this little fella. This is about, I don't know, maybe half the size of a snow goose, maybe a little bigger than that. But it's a Ross's goose. It's a rare one, rare goose from the West. And they have a little short stubby bill. Um, of course, Canada geese, what can I say? They're everywhere now. We do have wild ones that are separate from the, from the, from the feral ones, but <clears throat> um, and here are three snow geese that I had come in at, in formation. Swans are also real popular, I guess because they're big and you don't need fancy optical gear to view them. But swans are a lot of, a lot of fun to listen to and watch. They're at, they're at all of our refuges. Um, you know, for some reason, snow geese don't like the alligator refuge. You'll almost never see a snow goose out there, but the swans do. So <clears throat> this is a sunrise or sunset picture. That's why they're kind of golden yellow looking. I think watching them and hearing them <clears throat> fly over is the best part. <clears throat> Here are some birds you may think are ducks, but they're not. Um, Pied-billed grebes, it's a little diving bird actually related to rails. <clears throat> and um, common gallinule here, used to be called common moorhen. And coots, American coots, we have lots of coots. They form big rafts, too. You can see big old black rafts, like, you know, the size of this room. There'll be thousands of them all packed in there together. <clears throat> Eagles love to prey on them. This is just a silhouette sunset picture of some coots and greaves. <clears throat> and here again, just like in other areas, other habitats, when you get lots of waterfowl in one area, you're definitely going to attract eagles. So at Pea Island, you can usually spot an eagle or two in the winter. On Alligator River, you can. Um, Pocosin Lakes Refuge, sometimes you can count a dozen of them. <clears throat> but they like to just sit up in the trees mostly and be lazy and wait for, wait for one of the ducks to, you know, they're looking for weakened or, you know, sick waterfowl. If they can get somebody that's sick and can't fight back as well, then that's what they prefer. They're actually, they're actually quite the scavenger. They'll eat roadkill in a minute. <clears throat> and then um, the peregrine falcon down in the bottom right, they also can take ducks, especially smaller ones, as well as shorebirds. And, and that's our fastest bird right there. That's the fastest bird we have. And then Merlin comes in a close second. They're a lot smaller, but they, they feed on songbirds and shorebirds. <clears throat> and we have all of these in the winter. And actually, we have bald eagles year-round now. And actually, there's a nest along the causeway, if you all didn't know it, right across from Pirate's Cove. You have to look, you have to look south across from Pirate's Cove, and it's way out there in a, in a hammock of pine trees, but there's a big active nest there. <clears throat> actually, this is almost May. They're probably, the chicks are probably flapping their wings. Um, freshwater marshes. Like I say, there's not always a clear cutoff between saltwater and brackish and fresh, but these freshwater marshes are the kind you'd find like, like Kitty Hawk Bay, the northern outer banks from Duck to Kerala, um, um, Madame Mesquite, freshwater marshes. One of the most obvious birds you see in freshwater marshes and out here are red-winged blackbirds. 
I wanted to, I included this photograph because a lot of people have a hard time with that bird on the left. They want to know what kind of sparrow it is or something like that. It's just a female red-winged blackbird. <clears throat> and the males are really cool when they actually flare these red shoulders out. You know, that's strictly during the breeding season when there's other males around and they're, they're defending their territories and singing and all that. Really cool though. Um, marsh wrens, and they're nesting out here too. He's holding on to the, holding on to the marsh so it won't go away. Um, cute little birds, they have, they have a long bubbly song, and they're, they're little teeny things, and they build these big long nests, like this long and a little opening at the top. So it's, it's obviously, to me, thinking logically, it's obviously to keep some kind of predator at bay. Now, I don't know if it's, a, if it's snakes or what, but... Um, Anyway, this is pretty cool. Um, there are a lot of these in, in our marshes, but the place that I've seen the most and actually been able to see several nests is up at Mackey Island Refuge. There are lots of nests up there. In the freshwater marshes, instead of clapper rails, we have their, their look-alike, but, but much more colorful, we have the king rails. <clears throat> they're almost the same size, but they have this cinnamon chestnut color instead of just gray. And this is a king rail chick. As far as I can remember, all rail chicks are black when they start out. Um, this is a least bittern. This is a real secretive little heron relative that lives in freshwater marshes. And they're out here as well. Um, you hardly ever see them. Sometimes you'll see them flying over the marsh for 20 feet and then they drop back in. But every now and then you get lucky. Just had to pay your dues and spend a lot of time out in the field. Um, there are also um, common yellow throats, which is one of our warblers that live kind of around the perimeters of the marshes in the, in the thick areas. The males on the left, the females on the right. The males got to be big and bold and, and run off all the other males to defend this territory and sing and all that. The females needs to be drab and so she can stay down with the nest and, and things, predators won't see her. And here are some birds you can see in a freshwater marsh. Um, is this working? Common gallinule, um, a sora, um, swamp sparrow. These are mostly winter birds, fall through spring, but mostly they're, they're non-breeding non -breeding birds. They go elsewhere to have their babies. Okay, I think this is our last habitat, and you can go home. Um, the maritime forest. It, when I was when I was thinking about the maritime forest, I was thinking, well, where does it? What's the definition? I mean, there are lots of wooded areas. Are all the wooded areas around here maritime forest? Because um, there are there are some areas that are just pine forest around here. So I'm calling Nags Head Woods maritime forest, and um, Kitty Hawk Woods, and there's, there's an area up in Kerala. You know, a lot of oak trees and oaks and pines and ironwood, lots of, you know, nice variety of trees. Um, this is actually a good place for wood ducks right here. <clears throat> this is a shot of some of the typical habitat up in, up in Kerala. A lot of live oaks. Some of the permanent residents, these look like backyard birds, don't they? Some of the permanent residents are brown thrasher and pine warbler, and cardinal, northern cardinal, chickadee, Carolina chickadee, Carolina wren, and blue jay, just, just to name a few. <clears throat> and there are several woodpeckers that live in these woods too. The little downy woodpecker like we have that comes to our feeders. Um, Red-bellied woodpecker. Um, flickers, which I don't know if you know it, but flickers feed primarily on the ground. And then the big, majestic, pileated woodpecker that you can hear drumming a mile away has the big red crest. So it's a good day when you see one of those. <clears throat> um, there are two very common owls around here, and I'll tell you where a great horned owl nest is too, but there are lots and lots of screech owls in these maritime forests. Um, just have to go out at night and listen for them. You're not going to see them during the day like I did this one. Um, same with great horned owls. They're, they're nocturnal, obviously. Um, 
This is a great big owl. This is a little tiny. Screech owls are about like this. Great horns are about like this. Um, there's a great horned owl nest a mile from here in Mangio. As you drive into Mangio, where the government center is on the left, there's a beautiful osprey nest that's been out there for several years right by the road. Well, it's got great horns and great horned owls in it right now. <clears throat> the ospreys came back and the nest was already occupied because great horned owls start nesting in January. Ospreys don't come back till March. So um, the ospreys had to move. But right now the chicks are getting big. A couple days ago, one was sitting up high in the nest. It was almost as big as the adult. So better catch it while you can. So it's like right there across from the Napa store. Um, there are lots of species that migrate to the maritime forest to nest. I guess things are really good in these forests. Um, most of these come up from the tropics. <clears throat> Yellow-billed cuckoo, great crested flycatcher, um, red-headed woodpeckers, which we have some of those year-round, but not very many. They mostly just migrate up. Um, Eastern kingbirds, which will nest kind of around the perimeter in the more open areas. Um, Ruby-throated hummingbirds. We also have some, have some of those year-round, but it's a it's a small percentage of the total population. Most of them spend the winter far south of here. Um, ten or maybe 10 or 11 species of wood warblers that nest in our maritime forest, depending on which forest you're in. These are actually some of the more common ones. <clears throat> um, the prothonotary warbler on the left is probably the most common one you would find um, of these neotropical migrants that, that nest here. And um, this is the prairie warbler. They're real common. Hooded warblers are fairly common, but they're really hard to see. They're, they're really, very secretive. You can hear them singing, but they're, it's hard to see them. <clears throat> Northern Perula is our smallest warbler, pretty little blue and yellow bird. And oven bird is a kind of a greenish bird. Looks kind of like a thrush with those spots. <clears throat> and they, they spend a lot of their time on the ground. <clears throat> And they're actually named for the fact that they build a nest on the ground that looks like a little Dutch oven. I don't know what a Dutch oven is. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, whatever a Dutch oven is. <clears throat> um, we have a couple of vireos that, that come up from the south and spend the summer with us. Red-eyed vireo and white-eyed vireo. Red-eye. If you see one this time of year, it's going to be an adult. They have that nice chestnut throat. Later on in the year, you'll see mostly immature birds. They're very streaked underneath. These are four that are just fledged. And that one was just wondering what I was doing, looking at him. <clears throat> but they eat a lot of fish and obviously frogs too. That's, that's a frog pole. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> There are a lot of migrants, this is what bird watchers live for, there are a lot of migrants, neotropical migrants, that pass through this area and may spend a day or two in the maritime forest and other habitats, just kind of refueling, fattening up before they move on. These don't nest here at all, they just pass through. So, um, like, like black-throated blue warblers are fairly common. We see, I see quite a few every year. There are lots of Baltimore Orioles that come through here. Um, American red starts are common. Wilson's warblers, not so much. We get them every year, but that's kind of one of the rare ones. Same with Philadelphia vireo. Um, Veery, this is one of several species of thrush that come through that have beautiful songs. And this is a scarlet tanager. I know, I know it's ugly, but I had to put one in there. <clears throat> um, so this is, you know, for, for a birder, this is where the fun comes in because you can look at a cat bird or a cardinal every day, but you don't get many opportunities to see these birds in this area. This is a rose-breasted grosbeak. I've actually heard reports of these this week. I think they've just shown up. I've heard of, heard of two up north and one a little bit south of here. And they'll show, up to you, they'll, turn, they'll show up at your feeders, too. They love black oil and sometimes suet. <clears throat> so rose-breasted grosbeak. Um, and then we also have birds that come that um, migrate 
from the north to spend the winter in our maritime forest, you know, winter residents. And these include our yellow-bellied sapsucker, uh, swamp sparrow, blue-headed vireo, um, white-throated sparrow, which you have in your yards a lot, white-throated sparrows. Um, little tiny, little tiny winter wren. I mean, not any bigger than anything. Um, brown creepers, which are really strange birds. They creep up trees like some big insect. And black phoebes, which is a flycatcher. They actually nest across most of the state, but not, not here this far east. <clears throat> um, here's some other ones. Big picture for a tiny little bird. This golden crowned kinglet is smaller than a chickadee. And it's in a cypress, bald cypress tree. And like the, name, like the name says, it has a golden crown, which they can kind of raise and lower. And then ruby crowned kinglets are the same size as golden crowns. I know it doesn't look like it. The males have a ruby crown and, and, or red crown, and you, you, you rarely see it. But if they, um, if they get agitated at something, that's when they'll raise that red crest. And then cedar wax wings, um, you're probably familiar with them. We have them in the winter. And then you, you really see them mostly in late winter, early spring, when they're, when they're attacking your yopine hollies or your pyracanthers or whatever, the big flocks that come in and wipe out all your berries. They've actually started nesting in Dare County over the past, I don't know, 10 or 20 years. They're still in very low numbers, but, but they've actually started nesting here. And that's it. I'll, I'll take any questions now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. If you have a question, raise your hand, Karen, and a, a microphone will head your way. Where do, Doesn't sound like it's working. Okay. Where do the wax wings nest? Where are they starting to nest? They ne You mean location or the tree or the habitat? Uh, they, habitat they ne they're location. Ne they're nesting pine trees. Pine uh. trees, maybe halfway up. Um, so as, far, as far as where, uh, uh, alligator refuge. Okay. And I've seen them up in the Mackey Island area during summer, so I assume they were nesting. Do you think they'd go to Body Island? Probably. That's the probably pine good, trees? Probably. I mean, that's not, those are, those are slash pines. They're not really native to this area, but the birds really use them. But, um, but yeah, pine trees seem to be, I mean, I could be wrong, but pine trees seem to be the only tree they like to nest in. You, you mentioned that the brown pelicans population had been nearly decimated. Could you talk about what caused the reduction in the population and maybe how they came back? I think I'm pretty sure that it was pesticides and that we quit using them and they came back, just like with the bald eagles and the peregrine falcons. DDT, for one, was a pesticide that was used extensively and it, it caused the eggshells to be so thin that they couldn't even support themselves. Well, they couldn't support the, the bird that was supposed to incubate the eggs. So we've, um, we're eliminating some stuff. Right now, the scary thing are the neonics, the neonics, how do you say that word? The, the neonics, like, like when killing the bees, they're starting to make some correlations between that pesticide escaping into the environment and poisoning the insects, and then the birds eat the insects. So it's, it's always something. But as long as we can learn and correct and get better, then we're on the right path. Anybody else? <clears throat> I have a friend that has an osprey nest in the water in their backyard, and there was ospreys on it, and then a Canadian goose came and took it over about two weeks ago and hasn't left. Really? And I, I saw the osprey was highly upset, and I did get some pictures of it. So will the Canadian geese, you know, the uh, chicks I, do all right? Or? I've seen a couple of Canada geese on an osprey nest before, but I thought they were just resting. I can't imagine geese nesting up yeah, on an osprey just, platform. Yeah, it's, been, it's been two I'd weeks. Be, I'd like to know if they're nesting. If you, if you can determine that they're actually nesting, I'd like to know that because that would be... Well, it'd be bad I think for they one. are. The male stays there. I have some pictures. And it'd be bad for one thing if they are. Yeah. But um, I. But I can't help. I can't help your poor ospreys. <laughs> no, no. <clears throat> At least they can build nests. You got something still? Yeah. What kind? Of you had to wait for the. 
Oh, and I did, I did take all these photographs. Someone always asked me that, so. <clears throat> what type of camera are you using? Because you are taking some uh, great uh, photographs. I, I've got it with me here, hold on. Yeah, there it is. No, I'm just, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> We're originally from uh, Pocosin, Virginia, uh -huh. and uh, we had a osprey nest, similar to what she's talking about, raised up on a platform, and every spring, the geese and the osprey would war over who was gonna utilize that nest. And it got to be to where the geese would, would use it first, and then when they, uh, when they left the nest, the ospreys would come in and then they would nest. So the geese actually did nest there? Yes, sir. Well, you know, I've seen them, I saw them recently on the West Coast nesting along the ocean, the rough Pacific on these rocks out in the ocean, up, on, up high on the rocks. So I guess if they could do that, they could easily use an osprey platform. But that's not, that's not very good for the ospreys. You've got to figure out how to get those geese down. <laughs> um, that's interesting, though. Thanks for sharing that. I recently had uh, some, a pair of great crested flycatchers that are um, cavity nesters. And there's a hole in the bil a, a vent in the side of a building behind our house. And for the last two years, they would nest in that hole. This year, they came back and built a nest, and all of a sudden, I'm seeing sparrows coming out of it. Mm. And so I'm taking it that house sparrows are, are kind of an invader species that are taking yeah. over the nest. Yeah. They're, they're exotic, non-native. That's a big problem with bluebird houses, or especially purple martin houses. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, if that's a dryer vent, the eggs would probably hatch really quick. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but um, I guess maybe the vent could be closed or made smaller or a screen put over it, and maybe you could put up great crested flycatcher box or something. That's what I was Yeah, because they readily thinking. use boxes. You've got to have the right size and the right hole and all yeah, that. Yeah, it's got to be at least <clears throat> two-inch hole or something, something like that. for the male. To... We, we have one nest in a, in a wood duck box one time, so... They're not, they're not always as particular as you think, but, but the right size hole is good because it keeps larger things out, larger predators, yeah. especially squirrels. You want to use a metal guard around the hole to keep squirrels from chewing it out. Oh. <clears throat> if you have squirrels, you might not have squirrels down there. On uh, certain spill islands, do the pelicans have certain islands and the seagulls have certain islands? Uh, I don't see um, a mix. You don't see a mix usually, do you? They they sort of do. It, as, as far as I can tell, it depends on. I guess it's the age of the island because as the islands mature, as the vegetation matures and becomes thicker and thicker, and then woodier, the, then the species that nest there change. You know, the terns nest when it's just a sandy beach. The gulls start nesting when it starts becoming vegetated. And then when the shrubs, when it's a big high island and it's shrubby, then the pelicans move in. I mean, now there is, there is an island out, out there called Pelican Island. I don't know if all the pelicans use that island and don't use the others or not. That would be great. And there's, there's another island out there that's just covered in royal terms. So I, I, can, I can only sort of answer your question. It does matter. It makes a big difference on the vegetation that's on the island. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yes, um, up here. Um, as someone who works with a lot of tourists, I mean a lot, um, is there any either fact or important piece of information that you think they should know um, when they're engaging in learning about ecosystems or generally the business of ecotourism in general? Hmm, that's a big question. <clears throat> Maybe a bird joke? A bird joke? <laughs> well, the, 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 main, the main thing I would want them to know, the main thing I want the tourists to know is to watch out for the protected areas and not encroach on the, on the protected areas, which includes having your dog off of a leash, because you know, even if your dog is well behaved, if it runs in there one time and does a big U and comes out, there's no telling the damage it's done. So um, that would be the biggest thing. Um, I mean, if they're interested in seeing wildlife or seeing birds, 
Um, you know, Pea Island has guided bird walks so many days a week at 8 o'clock in the morning or something like that. You could, they could contact the, the um, you know, we have a really nice visitor center on the north end of Roanoke Island. They could go there or contact the, the visitor center, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and ask these questions about how they can, what ecotourism things there are. I mean, like on Alligator Refuge, they have a tram that goes out periodically to look, to look for the bears and the other wildlife. So there are, there are things like that. And there's a guy that has an a airboat that takes people out. I bet it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Don't do it. And there are the horse tours up in Corolla, but I don't know if that qualifies as for what you're talking about or not. Do you know about the visitor center at the end of Roanoke Island? The Gateway Visitor Center? That's what I was referring to, yeah. yeah. Well, they, we have the visitor center at Pea Island. Mm -hmm. at, on North Pond, mm -hmm. and there's also the Gateway Visitor Center, right. 100 Conservation Way, just nearly opposite the entrance to Fort Raleigh. Right. We have bird lists, maps of all the refuges, and information, uh, exhibits of various kinds of wildlife that we have. Beautiful photographs. We have free films, and we have an art display in the auditorium, and Jeff's done that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, there are certainly there are certainly lots of avenues that tourists can take to learn about the wildlife if that's if they're interested in, in that. You know, you can you can Google it. You can Google anything, of course. Anybody, there's one in the back, two in the back. <clears throat> um, the debris islands you're talking about that they've dredged, um, mm -hmm. what that are supposed to be so good for the birds? Where are they located? Mostly behind Oregon Inlet in the sound. I mean, you can, see, you can see one of them from the south end of the bridge, north end of Pea Island. One of, them, one of them called Green Island is right there fairly close. You can use a spotting scope and, and identify the birds that are there, but none of them are, you know, you need a boat. And even then you don't need to get off onto the island. So, I mean, there are, there are some, I mean, there's a couple over here near Wanchies and they're scattered around, but they're mostly if not entirely this way. I don't think there's any that way. I mean, there are some islands to the north, like Monkey Island off Kerala, which is a big heronry, but it's not a spoil island, as far as I know. Anybody else? Oh, and I shoot with a cannon, with cannons, cannon equipment, cannon lenses. Yeah. That's what beautiful photograph. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for coming.